Yeah, good. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, thanks, Rick and um, Helen, um, for giving me the opportunity to join also today this panel of speakers and um, looks very interesting. The other presentations as well. I look forward to them. And um, I was asked to maybe give a little bit of an overview about um, remote sensing for mineral exploration in general, the pros and cons, and um, and also the pros and cons of the different sensor types and um, how to access the imagery. And when, um, when I was talking then with Rick and, and Helen about what roughly I should present about um, in more detail, um, Rick basically sent me those questions roughly <laughs> that I just um, um, put here on the screen. And I tried to cover them today in, the, um, um, in, in my presentation. So the questions were how, to, um, um, how do I assess, assess whether remote sensing data will be of use in my area for exploration anyway? Um, another question is, what should I be looking for in remote sensing data sets when exploring for some of the common deposit types in, in Queensland in general? Um, do I need specialist software to access remote sensor data or to process them? Or what do I do with these data anyway? And um, is there maybe also a workflow that, for example, Cesar Rowe could suggest um, for explorers to how to best use those remote sensor data, how to incorporate spaceborne, airborne, but also drill core and field spectrometer data in their workflow? And so I'll try to cover on these um, uh, well, many questions today. I just have to minimize the other screen because otherwise I can't see mine. Um, um, so the outline of the, of the presentation, um, which aims to cover or, or most of these questions, um, I'll first give an introduction uh, uh, and into spectral sensing and spectral sensing technologies uh, with a focus on remote sensing. And then I will dive straight into some geoscience tuned remote sensing data that are available for Queensland and what, what has been done over the past, well, 30 years. Um, in Queensland in, in, with regards to using remote sensing, remote sensing for mineral exploration. And I also develop maybe a little bit on how to integrate or what you can do when you integrate um, remote and proximal sensing data and not only the reflectance um, spectral data, but also other geoscience data sets. And then end with the, the summary. So to start, um, as an example, maybe a brief introduction into reflectance spectroscopy. Um, I'm a geologist, so I, I like to start with the geological side. And on the left-hand side of this um, slide, we, we see um, a little cartoon of a quartz alunite epithermal system. And um, so it's a classical epithermal system where we have um, our hydrothermal bracture that contains um, all the goodies, all the, the good metals and so on. And um, this one is surrounded by uh, these different mineral alteration um, halos. And we see changes in the mineral assemblages of these um, alteration um, fronts around our mineralization. So um, from proximal to the mineralization to distal to mineralization, we are going through the quartz alunite zone, then the quartz carnalite, dikite, and, and alunite zone. Then we are ending up in the uh, more argillic and, and, and phyllic alteration zones. And if we go very far away from the deposit, we will end up in the green rocks in the propolitic alteration. Um, so this is good, this is well understood. Um, and um, if you're exploring for these kind of deposits, then you can look for the different minerals, but it's very obviously very difficult for, our, for us as humans, just with our human eyes to, to distinguish if there's a little bit of kaolinite in the sample or not, or if it's rather um, a well-crystalline kaolinite or a poorly crystalline kaolinite or an alumus mactite. So it gets really, really difficult. Um, and we are very lucky to, um, with the reflectance spectroscopy, because there are a lot of um, um, sensors around that actually help us to characterize those different minerals very reliably. So on the right hand side, this is one of these um, diagrams that shows some spectral signatures of some of the typical minerals that we find in epithermal systems. And we're looking here at um, the short wave infrared part of the reflectance spectrum. Yeah. So it's always important to, when, when I show these squiggly lines also, when anyone shows to you the reflectance spectra, um, really have a close look at what kind of wavelength range you're actually looking at. Yeah. So in this case, we are between um, roughly 1.3 and 2.5 micrometers, which is the um, good parts of the short wave infrared. And I ordered these um, different reflectance spectra in accordance to um, the, the proximity to the mineral deposit. So we're starting maybe from the top with the green rocks. We are looking at some epidote and chloride. And um, then if we're going downwards in this diagram, we're moving through um, illite, sort of the phyllic alteration, and then um, the smectites and the different kaolinite types, so the argillic alteration, and then ending up with alunite. So these are the shortwave infrared active minerals of those mineral assemblages in these, in these alteration footprints. 
We can't see quartz with this sensor. So that's the first point to really to remember and to uh, be aware of when you're using reflectance spectroscopy. Different wavelength ranges will enable us to, to map different minerals, characterize different minerals. And in the short wave infrared, we are blind to quartz, basically. We might be able to, to map some opaline silica, but not quartz, like a, a very, very crystalline quartz. Um, and I also would like to emphasize that um, these are not just um, like um, random spectral signatures. Um, all these different um, absorption features, these troughs in the short range thread that I pointed out there with the arrows, um, we know actually quite well what kind of molecule causes the absorption. So what leads to the absorption um, process basically. And so we're not just um, collecting different bands of reflectance spectra and try to identify different classes, but we actually understand really, um, at least for the short of infrared, very well what kind of absorption features are related to which mineral. So this really empowers us to really make most use of the reflectance spectra. Um, mapping hydrothermal systems is one, one application for reflectance spectroscopy, and um, but we also are, of course, interested in regular characterization, especially in Australia here, where so many, so, so many parts of Australia are covered by um, um, regolith, and we are trying to um, explore through the, um, the regolith. Um, so I show you an example that uh, Tom Cuddy and others from Cesar Rowe pulled together in 2005. On the right-hand side, you see uh, airborne hyperspectral mineral map data, and um, they have been processed um, into a product that shows us the crystallinity of kaolinite. Why do we do that? Uh, why do we look at this? Um, this is explained on the left-hand side of the slide. So we have um, on the top left, um, short of infrared reflectance spectra, just a very narrow part of this short of infrared um, to highlight differences between a poorly ordered and a well-ordered kaolinite. Um, we want to distinguish between poorly and well-ordered kaolinite because as a rule of thumb, we can use it as a proxy for in situ regolith versus a transported regolith, which is then important for drilling campaigns and so forth. So this is captured in the cartoon that Tom put together uh, on the, on the, there on the bottom left. Different regolith environments are, are dominantly characterized by different types of kaolinite and other minerals as well, but kaolinite is, is probably one of the most useful or easiest, easiest proxy for characterizing regolith. So we can classify um, the, the, the transported versus the in situ regolith, and that's what we, um, how we use this map on the right-hand side. Blue areas would be a poorly ordered kaolinite, that means it's transported material. The yellow to, or greenish yellow to red colors would be a, a well crystalline kaolinite, which means it's in situ material. And therefore we can actually map out um, different um, outcrops, like the, you see in the center of the map, um, the, the super pit. Um, 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 uh, next to Kalgoorlie. So regolith mapping is, an, uh, is, is, is something we can do with these remote sensing data. Um, we can also map mineral footprints and I'm using here an example from um, um, using multispectral aster data. The example is from the Eastern Arunta and Laya um, where um, in the Jervois area where, where people found some copper gold mineralization and it has been um, uh, well documented already since, since quite some time. And we use this to evaluate our aster mineral maps to see if we can maybe assist um, a geological mapping or, or mapping mineral footprints. So if you look on the left-hand side in this diagram, you see a map of the Jervois copper gold um, um, area. And this J-shaped trend basically consists, uh, comprises uh, metamorphic schists um, with dominated by quartz chloride, some biotite, but also um, mainly muscovite, cordyrite, garnet, magnet, and, and magnetite. So we tried to use the uh, aster mineral maps to simply follow this um, um, lithology that hosts the mineralization. And um, on, the, on the right hand side, you see now the plot, um, different aster mineral maps that we created. Um, and on the, on the top right, we see the aluminum H group content. And in this context, this enables us to map out the abundance of white mica, the relative abundance of white mica. Red um, and colors mean that um, red colors mean it's a high abundance, blue colors mean it's a low abundance. And we see that, yeah, we can roughly follow that trend. We see maybe a lot of very enhanced um, white mica alteration um, following this mineralized zone. But what we also noticed, it, and that's shown in the, in the bottom images on the bottom right, lower right, um, we, we noticed in other aster mineral maps that there is some um, evidence for maybe biotite or chloride alteration, which was not noticed necessarily outside of that ore bearing um, schists. And um, 
we did this actually on the fly, that kind of exercise with Matilda Thomas when we did a workshop for um, NTGS um, in, in Alice Springs. And there was an exploration company that also um, was exploring actively in this area. And they said, well, there's maybe some alteration, but that, that probably doesn't lead to anything. Um, but they, they went there to the field after the workshop. They went to the field and had a look anyway, and they found some quartz veins that they um, sampled, and they found um, 60 grams per ton gold in those quartz veins. So we basically um, used um, the, the aster derived mineral maps to, to map out the geology, uh, mineral assemblages, and we noticed um, some maybe unusual mineral footprints. And that pointed the company then towards um, to that area and they found some gold, which was a quite nice, neat um, case study. Okay, moving on. Um, so, there are a lot of different sensors available in reflectance spectroscopy, and that's why I like that technology also so, so much and use it so heavily. Um, we can use reflectance spectroscopy from space using um, space-borne data like the ASTA um, 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 system, for example, or Sentinel was presented or um, talked about before already, um, but also airborne hyperspectral sensors like shown there in the middle. That's the HIMAP system, the uh, um, HiVistas HIMAP system. It's an Australian system. And um, then we've got also field spectrometers and I'm showing there at the, in the bottom, it's a, it's a terra, terra spec from, from uh, Malvern Panalytical. At the, at the top, we've got an handheld FTIR, which measures the different wavelength range. And on the left-hand side, um, we've got the, the high logger, which is as an example for hyperspectral drill core scanners. And we also have microscopes even that measure down to 10 uh, micrometer resolution spots, the reflected light. So it's one of the few, maybe the only, um, um, geoscience tuned um, um, technology uh, where we can actually use the same kind of data from space down to the microscope level, which really is, makes it very easy to, to understand then um, the relationships um, across scales. Okay, so the next slide um, shows an, a, a summary about of, of different spectral sensing instruments and the wavelength ray regions um, they, 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 these different instruments sample and also the spectral um, resolution. It's a quite busy slide, but um, I will try to go through it in a somewhat logical manner. So if you start with the, with the x-axis at the bottom, we've got um, two um, um, uh, unit systems. We've got it in micrometer and wave numbers. And if we just focus on micrometers, um, we see that um, we are looking at the wavelength range between 0.3 micrometer up to 24 micrometers, yeah? And um, in, in different disciplines, in different science disciplines, um, um, different use, uh, the people use different labels for the different wavelength ranges. That's a bit unfortunate. That's leading to quite some confusion. But um, in terms of uh, geoscience or especially for mineral exploration, um, the people you mainly um, rely back on, 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 rely on the remote sensing uh, discipline. And um, therefore we're using um, this uh, labeling as specified there. So we've got our visible part of the spectrum, of course, between roughly 400 and uh, 0.4 and 0.7 uh, micrometers, then entering the near infrared. The short wave infrared is roughly between 1 and 2.5 micrometers. Then we're entering the mid wave infrared, thermal infrared, and so forth. Um, if you look at this curve that is displayed there, this is the transmission curve, the atmospheric transmission curve. And this is very important. Um, in remote sensing because the atmosphere, um, I'm, I'm glad of course that it's there, but um, it can be a bit of, of, of a nuisance for, for people that want to do mineral exploration. And um, basically um, it's shown here the transmission of the, of the atmosphere and all the wavelength ranges, ranges where we have a, 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 a atmospheric windows, so where we have a high transmission, these are the wavelength ranges we can use for mineral mapping. So if you look at this wavelength range around just below two micrometers, so around 1.9 micrometer, we see a big atmospheric um, gap. And, and this is basically because of, of the water absorption in the atmosphere. So we can't collect any remote sensing data from that wavelength range for mineral mapping because it's just noise to us basically. Yeah. Um, but we are quite lucky in, in that um, many of the minerals that we, are, or most of the minerals we are interested in, like for example, those clay minerals that I introduced at the beginning, or let's say chlorides, epidotes, white micas, and so on, they, they actually show diagnostic absorption features in those atmospheric windows. So we are really lucky. Um, and this is uh, just um, up, um, summarized at the very top of this diagram. You've got um, certain funny acronyms, but basically everything where it says OH, it means we can map uh, a clay mineral, for example, or an actinolite or epidote, for example. And um, 
in the thermal infrared is where we can identify um, minerals that don't contain hydrox hydroxyl groups, um, like for example, quartz simply or garnet, but also apatite and lots of, and, and the carbonates and so forth and, and other minerals. So different wavelength regions or this different atmospheric windows allow us to, to map different minerals. And then finally, there's a, um, a, a quite a long list here of different instruments, uh, not only remote sensing, but also field spectrometers and lab FTIR as mentioned as well. And I tried basically to capture, to, to, to summarize which wavelength region is captured by the different instruments. And you can see that, for example, the lab FTIR, you can measure the whole reflectance spectrum across the whole spectrum. So you can map um, almost all minerals also nicely with this one. But uh, with remote sensing, if we use the HIMAP as an example, which is this airborne hyperspectral system run by HiVista, it only collects visible near short of infrared. And therefore, we can map, for example, iron oxides, we can map chlorides and amphiboles and these kind of minerals, but we can't map quartz. We can't map feldspar. Um, we are blind to those ones with this instrument. Um, if you look at Aster, Aster, and uh, um, here I uh, highlighted the, the, the different bands that are collected with Aster. It's a multispectral system, so there are only a few bands, but they have actually been um, um, positioned at, at, at very good locations for, for, ge for geoscientists. So it's really a geoscience tuned sensor in the end. You see there's, there are like um, five bands in the short wave infrared, number, bands number five, six, seven, and eight, uh, eight and nine. And they are really nicely located so that we can actually distinguish between a white mica and um, a chloride and a carbonate, for example. If you compare that to Landsat, we can't do that. Landsat has only one band in the, in the short infrared, in, in that part of the short infrared. So if we're using Landsat band seven, we will only be able to, to map, okay, there's maybe some hydroxylated mineral or maybe a carbonate, but we don't know. The only mineral you really can identify with Landsat if you don't, if you don't train it with other um, information, um, the only mineral you can map with Landsat is uh, iron oxides. That's the only one. Um, I wanted to add just um, also with Aster, yeah, that, that the thermal infrared, infrared range is also covered. So we've got five more bands there. So with Aster, we can actually map quartz or the total silica content, for example. And in some areas, we were even um, successful in mapping um, garnet, for example. So you can, you can do these things. Okay, moving on um, quickly. Um, the, it's, it's important to understand the different um, wavelength regions and the spectral resolution. Um, I just go through this very quickly because I'm already over time here for, for, for my own slides. Um, um, this slide basically just tries to um, capture that um, hyperspectral um, data can be used to map um, the different mineral species and we can map different um, um, the, the, we can dis distinguish between propolytic, phyllic, and advanced argillic alteration, for example. And we can do that for um, high logo data, for example, like from the NVCL, that's the left hand diagram. We can use that uh, from high map derived information, so airborne hyperspectral, but also we can use maybe space borne hyperspectral systems like NMAP. NMAP hasn't been launched yet, but uh, once it's launched, it, it, we should be able to map the different um, um, uh, propolytic and phyllic alteration and so on. Um, compared to Aster, again, this Aster is a multispectral um, 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 sensor. Uh, we have just a few bands left that we can use for mapping um, the different mineral assemblages. And so it gets a bit more tricky. We need more assistance from other information to be able to uh, distinguish different um, alteration mineral assemblages. Okay, next slide shows a long list of different um, um, space-borne multispectral systems. And um, if we just briefly look at um, well, it started all in the 70s with Landsat, basically, in terms of infrared reflectance spectroscopy. So Landsat one just straddled the, the near infrared, basically. Um, but then 1999, we, um, Aster was launched um, by, um, by the Japanese. And we had so, uh, the first really geoscience tuned multispectral sensor up, up in, in, in space. And we created lots of interesting mineral maps from, from these data. And it's really useful for mapping. Um, if we just go, if you browse quickly through this list further down, um, so um, Sentinel was mentioned, for example. Um, Sentinel is a, is, a, is a useful system for classification of land surfaces, but you really need um, additional geoscience data or validation data to train that to be able to really identify maybe specific minerals or mineral groups. Um, 
just last year um, um, Prisma was launched and also Desis and now so now since 2019 life gets really exciting for remote sensing people because now we have um, hyperspectral space bond systems and we're in the process of evaluating those ones and I'll show, I'll show some examples later on about that. Um, just briefly on if, if you maybe look at that presentation later on again a little bit um, in the video, um, um, I highlighted in green basically which information is useful for geoscience applications and in red, what is not so useful or it's a problem. Like Hyperion, for example, was hyperspectral satellite system, but it had a very low um, signal to noise ratio, which rendered it almost useless for geoscience. Okay, coming to Queensland, and I've got only 10 minutes left. Um, so uh, that in Queensland, actually things um, with remote sensing started very, very early. And um, I was um, lucky that John Hunt Huntington provided me with this um, um, report here from um, a, a study they have done in, in the early 90s, uh, 1980s already on Mary Kathleen um, using an, an, an airborne sensor, an airborne line profiler. So this was not an imaging system. This was a line profiler, basically like a high logger just from the air. Um, and you and on, in that cartoon on the left hand side in the diagram you see basically uh, a certain area covering the mine site or the surroundings of the mine site and then different um, spectral signatures that they captured that they collected along that along track basically from west to east in this case and they were able to already then in 1982 to to distinguish um, hornblende from epidote from from different smectites and so forth so that's really exciting. And Australia really has been leading this field for, for since then, basically, I would say. Um, in the late 80s, um, Geoscan came along. And this was a, um, um, a system um, um, and also a company then um, afterwards, ma mainly run by Bob Agar. Um, and um, this system was successful. This was an imaging system. And it was not hyperspectral, but a, a multispectral system, but a um, very well designed um, multispectral system that enabled um, Bob and others to um, 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 map uh, mineral footprints. And this led actually to led to some discoveries, like the Had Hadley Castle mine, for example. So um, that's an interesting um, um, case study that's a little bit older already. Um, then a little bit of a jump through time. Um, in the, in the late 2000s, um, um, Cesar Rowe then um, was lucky to, um, to get um, GSQ and also GA and James Cook University on board to, um, to join in the next generation mineral mapping project. And this was also when I came, I came into um, um, this whole um, um, play here and, and moved to Australia basically. And I had no idea about remote sensing before I entered um, um, the Australian soil. But then um, I went to an excursion um, 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 as part of the STOMP conference, 2005, I think, and learned about the Mount Eisen layer. I was completely confused because of this random geology, I would say. And, but then I was um, offered these airborne hyperspectral data and my postdoc was on ground validating those data. And this was just heaven, basically. Um, so um, Tom and colleagues basically generated a lot of different mineral maps from these airborne hyperspectral data. And there's an example shown on the right hand side that covers the, 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 um, the Stara area. And it's a false color image on the, on, on the left hand side. On the right hand side, it shows the white mica composition. So from aluminum rich mica in blue to aluminum poor mica in, in red. And, um, but Tom and others from Cicero um, um, pre, uh, prepared lots of other mineral maps that helped us really, really to to map out um, the, um, um, the geology in that area and try to identify mineral footprints and so forth. Um, but it was not only the um, high map data. Um, there were, we, we also collected lots of field data for ground validation. The Aster mineral maps were created for that area. So the first greater, larger Aster um, um, mosaic was created and, and so forth. So I want to show briefly some examples what, what has been done with these mineral maps. There are, there are a number of case studies around. Um, so the first one is maybe you've seen that map already, Rick, Rick showed that already at the beginning of the presentation of the seminar today. And the first example I want to show is actually from the Georgetown block. And uh, Tom put that together and he used um, airborne hyperspectral data from the Georgetown block and um, um, around, my, uh, sorry, around uh, Mount, the Mount Turner porphyry epithermal system and um, integrated that straight away with um, high logger data available from the same area. So and that's what you see in this kind of a 3D model on the left hand side. So what you're looking at, you're looking from underneath to the sur Earth surface. And um, so underneath the, the, the airborne hyperspectral map um, coloring the Earth's surface. 
and um, highlighted is there this, this bluish area, which is dominated by kaolinite, which was interpreted basically as the um, advanced agilic alteration footprint around the mineral system, in, in that mineral system there. Whereas the, the area surrounding that blue area, so the ones in, in green to red, is the more phyllic alteration zones, so dominated by, by muscovite or elite, for example. And you can see that in the airborne data, you can see that in the drill core data and at the same time. So um, that's, a, that's a quite interesting case study for mapping mineral footprints. Um, and um, there were numerous, numerous other um, case studies um, done, for example, on, on Tick Hill on the area, mainly used for regolith mapping. And this slide is just to, to stress basically that we can, map, we can um, create different mineral maps from these airborne hyperspectral data and, but we also really need to do the ground validation. And that's always what has been done here with, with these um, case studies. So you see in these diagrams on the bottom, some field spectrometer data on the y-axis plotted against the corresponding pixels from the high map data and the correlation between the two. So we always need to link um, and ground, link the airborne data, the remote sensor data with surface data for, for validation. Um, we can combine different mineral abundance maps, for example. So we, we played around a little bit with the data and tried to see if we can get a better coverage um, and, and a more satisfying maybe um, um, geological map out of these mineral maps. In this case, I looked at um, um, a part um, of the Cloncorry Fault, the Maligap Mali granite to the west of the Cloncorry Fault, and I combined the white mica abundance, the carinate abundance, and an, another a mineral map called the ferrous iron associated with MGUH, which maps basically chloride, amphibols, and so forth. And when you compare this, this, this combined mineral map, you can com it compares very nicely with the published geology. But what we also noticed is actually really interesting structures in the center. You see that Melly uh, Gap granite, and you see this halo, not, not halo, but it's like a, a, a rim of white mica alteration in, in, um, towards the center of the or in, in, in the rim of this Medigap granite, yeah? And we interpreted this basically as how far fluids interacted um, from fluids that interacted um, during the intrusion of the, of the granite, the fluids migrated into the country rock and then back into the, the, into the granite and altered the granite. And that's how far they went back into the granite. That's how we are interpreted it basically. So you can also develop then geological, um, 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 Try to get an understanding about the genesis of, 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 of the of your geological environment from these airborne mineral maps. Okay, and um, if you combine a lot of different um, mineral maps, of course, we, we, we don't only use only remote sensing, only um, hyperspectral remote sensing data or multispectral. We always look at the radiometrics, we look at the magnetics and other, other data that, that are available to us. And um, so we've done it also for the Stara area. And um, because of time, I might just um, skip to the next slide straight away. So this is just the area right east of the Stara um, um, uh, open pit, um, which is highlighted there in reddish colors in the bottom left of this deposit and there's uh, of this mineral map, of mineral map. And there's a little picture on the left hand side. And what you can see here, these different colors show you changes in the white mica composition. So basically, blue colors would be an aluminum rich white mica like muscovite. Uh, red colors would be aluminum poor white mica like fengite. And what we um, noticed basically is that the white mica composition is, is very low in the, in, the, in the country rock, in the, to, the far, to, the, to the far west and far east. It's also a little bit low along the central um, line there, highlighted by these this, this red dots. This is um, a fault zone. But then it, in, it increases, the white mica composition um, changes to more aluminum poor white micas if you, if you go to the west and, and to the east. And that's where the mineral deposits are. So it's really interesting to map out these chemical gradients from these remote sensor data in that area. Okay. Um, I have only very short time left. I, I, I might um, have to go maybe two, three minutes over time. Sorry about that. I hope that's okay. Um, I just wanted to briefly touch on the Aster mineral maps that were then based on that mosaic that was constructed in this part of the NGMM project with, with GSQ and so on. Um, we then, um, Cesaro went further and said, okay, why not doing the whole continent? Because we can. So we used uh, 30,000 scenes that we turned through and, um, and combined um, 4,000 roughly out of those ones into one big mosaic spanning the whole continent of Australia and created the same mineral maps that were also produced for the NGMM product project basically before. And one of them you can see here, this is the acid derived aluminum OH content 
from um, Australia. Um, and warm colors mean a lot of aluminum OH bearing minerals. That includes kaolinites, aluminum smectites, and white mica, for example. And blue means low abundance. And yeah, you can see different geological provinces already um, 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 with, with this um, single mineral map. And we've also worked on the ground validation um, is, um, of these of this astral mineral maps, mainly using the National Geochemistry Survey of Australia data set by Carita and Cooper. Um, so where we scanned basically all those samples with, with um, FTIR and with um, field spectrometers um, to, 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 to calibrate and to um, validate our astral mineral maps. In, in Queensland, we went, um, or Tom then specifically went a step further. We noticed that um, um, on the left hand side, you see the first version of the uh, Aster mineral map of the aluminum age group composition. So this will distinguish um, white micas and smectites mainly in red, yellow colors versus carinite in blue colors. Um, you will you see there are lots of gaps basically, and and it was very stripy and very um, not very. Um, 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 not satisfying. So uh, Tom went along and did some more advanced processing of this data and um, trying to reduce the impact of green and dry vegetation. Dry vegetation especially has a big impact on, on our mineral mapping. And he, he succeeded with that also. And that was um, uh, published as Aster version two, for, which is only available for Queensland at the moment. And maybe at some stage someday also available for the rest of Australia. Okay, I didn't talk much about accessing those data, but I, I had some links in some of the slides. Just with, um, for example, the Aster version one and Aster version two maps, there are some links on, the, on this um, page here, on this slide. Um, they can be downloaded from CSRO's data access portal, but they also can be downloaded from um, GSQ. And um, these are the kind of uh, files that you can download there. So. Um, these TIFF files and ECWs or TFW files, you can import them straight away in, into, into GIS, into QGIS and so on and use them there. And we produce these mineral maps actually also um, the reason, uh, one reason for us to do that was that to basically remove all the, the big hurdle of doing the atmospheric processing and, and pre-processing of this mineral map, of this um, satellite data. When you're dealing with remote sensing data, it's not just simply doing a band ratio and then thanks, that's it. Um, you really need to do lots of pre-processing. And that's, that's, a, that's a really tricky part um, 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 of, that, of that work. But with those mineral maps that we produced, you can simply upload them into GIS. Okay, um, other people have then used also, oh, that's done by David Cole and others here also from CSRO in collaboration with GSQ. They used um, the Aster mineral mapping products together with um, 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 other um, um, remote sensor data and uh, radiometrics, for example, to try and automatically map the geology of the eastern um, part of the Mount Isen layer. So you see in these maps the simplified geology as, as it was provided, and then the, in the, in the, the central um, map, let's say, or the second from right, you see the, 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 the one that was automatically derived from basically combining all these different um, 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 layers. And you end up almost with the same picture, basically. And on the very right hand side, you end up with a probability. Uh, you, it gives you an, um, um, information about the probability, how, how um, happy we are with the, with, the, with, the, with the output, let's say. Good. Um, I also want to highlight quickly um, something very new, exciting happened last year when uh, Prisma was launched. Prisma is the hyperspectral satellite system run, um, um, which was um, launched by the Italian Space Agency, ASI, last year. And they have collected already heaps of data over Australia, and we haven't really, um, we have just now started looking at those data sets. And um, there are lots of details on that slide. I might jump straight to the next one. Just yesterday, I downloaded um, um, the scene for covering the Metacudi culmination for those ones who are familiar with the Mount Isa and Laya. And I simply did an RGB image, image using three main um, bands of interest for me because I'm a geologist and mineralogist. So that's the 21, um, um, 59 nanometer feature for kaolinite or pyrophyllite, the 2206 nanometer feature for um, white micas mainly and kaolinites, and then 2250 feature for chlorides. And that's what I came up with here basically. I just did it like in five minutes in, in Envy. And um, it maps out um, the Mar Maraba volcanics quite, nice, quite nicely in the area, but that requires much more work. We, and we also need to get a better understanding of, of this hyperspectral data that are presented to us now. So we need to evaluate those squiggly lines that are shown on the top left in this, in this um, screen. 
but um, exciting data set. And I'm wondering if we can actually combine all these um, available mineral maps and basically recreate um, these, these airborne hyperspectral mineral maps that we created from the PRISMA data. Okay, um, other spectral data available from- um, better, better start looking to wrap it up now, Karsten. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, yeah <laughs> we're nearly 10 that. minutes over. Oh, 10? Um, okay, good. Then I might skip the NVCL. Um, most of you know that, of that, um, about that already, of course, and, and Rick mentioned it. Um, I may just go straight to the, to the original questions and my responses, let's say. So um, questions, how do I assess whether remote sensing data will be of use in my area? You need to, I, I would say um, personally, you would need to start with the Georgia question. This, and because this will determine which sensor you could be used. If you're interested in a scan system, let's say, um, and you're looking for alteration minerals like garnets and, and so on, then it's no use to use visible near short wave infrared um, reflectance spectroscopy because you can't see the garnet. So you need to use a thermal infrared sensor, yeah? So think about very carefully, first the geological question, and then you choose a sensor or build the sensor. Um, what should I be looking for in remote sensing data sets when exploring for some of the common deposit types in Queensland? Um, so the, it's important to, to, to make sure that the appropriate wavelength range is collected. Again, like I said before, if, you are, if you're interested in quartz, then you need thermal infrared sensing and, and, and so forth. You also need the appropriate spatial resolution. Do you, is a 10 meter size pixel enough for you? Or, or, do, you, or do you need five meter size pixel or, or 10 centimeter even? I usually found 10 meter size pixels are actually good enough for most applications for most mapping you wanna do. And you also need to download the right processing level. So um, with the different remote system data, you get different processing levels from raw data up to um, atmospherically corrected and so forth. And then maybe some mineral maps, which level of processing would you like to use or can you use also? That's important thing to think about. Um, do I need expensive software to access remote sensor data? Um, not for as accessing the raw data or the geoscience products, but if you want to do further, further processing, then yes. So you can import the mineral maps, for example, straight into QGIS. You can do some, or, or, or ArcGIS or something, or MapInfo. You can do some band ratios in those, um, 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 software package, package as well, but you can't do the atmospheric processing. You can't do any of the any any of the processing that is needed before you actually create a band ratio. Yeah, so I just would say be careful. Maybe get trained or or contract an expert for that one. Um, is there a workflow? Well, I really was running through lots of slides today here, and um, there are lots of published case studies and lots of detail. And I would say just this, this NGMM report from 2008 is probably the best place to start because it, it, it shows how to use airborne, spaceborne, spectral data, how to ground validate them, how to compare it with um, XRD, with geochemistry and so forth. It's all in that report basically. So I think that's the best point to start. Okay, um, just very last slide and sorry, really sorry about <laughs> um, um, being so much over time, but um, it's an exciting um, topic. And um, because someone else is talking about raw earth elements later, I uh, also want, just want to drop in this one here. There's an instrument attached to the International Space Station called DESIS, and that one was used to map raw earth from space, raw earth elements. And I might leave you just with this impression and thank you for your attention. <laughs>